going to talk a little bit about um, our views on Southeast Asia, where we see value, where we see opportunity, and I hope you enjoy it. So this is, this is all about Southeast Asia. A lot of people don't really know that, you know, we have probably the highest economic growth in the whole world. And because of it, um, we, we're going to get a lot of scale over the next uh, few decades. So by 2050, actually in terms of sizes, you would have China, number one, India, number two, US, number three, and Southeast Asia, number four. So it's going to be bigger than, than Europe and uh, quite a lot of other countries. And you can see, you know, Philippines is one of the fastest growing regions in Southeast Asia, uh, together with Vietnam and Indonesia. Yeah, <laughs> I think the, the reason for this very strong growth is obviously um, the very favorable demographics. Uh, population is young, median age of 30, and you know, the bulk of the people in the population is between 15 and uh, 40 years old. So Singaporeans are very, very envious of uh, people in the Philippines and Vietnam and Indonesia because we're getting old and <clears throat> we don't have enough babies. Yeah, so I think one of the biggest themes that's going to happen to Southeast Asia over the next five years is that it's going to grow up as a manufacturing hub. I don't know whether you remember, but before 1997, you know, a lot of factories were manufacturing goods uh, out for the world, out of Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Philippines. But because of the Asian financial crisis, a lot of this was, was derailed and uh, manufacturing started to go towards China. So China had a whole decade where they became the factory of the world and uh, got very strong GDP growth as a result. But if you look at some of the recent trends, you'll find that manufacturers are moving away from China into Southeast Asia. So this is something that's done by Deloitte. And basically, they talk about competitiveness in attracting manufacturers, and they see competitiveness of China going down in the next five years. And who is going to gain from this is uh, the countries of Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, and India. So most of these countries are in Southeast Asia. I think a lot more companies are going to move their operations from China into Southeast Asia. And there's a, there's a few reasons for this. One is uh, probably because of cost. So China's done a lot of the low-end manufacturing. They are moving up the value chain. They are investing in technology and innovation. And as a result, costs have gone up. So if you look at their wage costs, it's doubled in the last five years. And it's now three to four times more expensive to manufacture uh, in China than uh, in Southeast Asia. I think the bulk of the cost is wage cost. About 50% of their business cost is wage cost. So wage is a big part of the problem. And another part is obviously construction cost in China has gone up 25% as well. So another reason is because companies want to be closer to their customers and they can see this huge pool of customers in Southeast Asia. Consumption is strong. Again, Philippines, number one. You know, <laughs> a lot of consumption growing at 7% a year and that's cumulative as well. And I think that's because, you know, the young people, they are going from agriculture and mining into manufacturing jobs, into service jobs, so they're getting wage growth and the middle income population is growing 9% every year in Southeast Asia. And uh, in certain countries like, you know, Philippines, Vietnam, and Indonesia, we're talking about 15 to 20% CAGR. Uh, so that's the consumption. And com a lot of countries, uh, the governments are also taking a proactive step. For example, in Indonesia, if you want to sell a mobile phone in Indonesia, 30% of what's in the phone has to be made in Indonesia. Otherwise, you can't sell it there. So the local content rules are encouraging manufacturers to say, okay, how many phones are we going to sell in Indonesia? We better build our factory there. So there's rules around local content, not just for electronics, but also for some of the textiles categories as well. And of course, the third one is infrastructure. You know, we, we heard a lot, a lot about infrastructure development in Philippines just now in this afternoon. But... Well, China's going to spend even more money into infrastructure through the One Belt, One Road initiative. And it's going to link up a lot of the countries, well, not Philippines, but, you know, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, Myanmar, Cambodia, even all the way down to Malaysia and Singapore. So when you connect it, uh, you get more markets, you get more customers, you, you get easier flow of goods. And I think that's why a lot more companies are investing 
into industrial and logistics facilities uh, in Southeast Asia. So, JLL, we feel that the biggest potential is for investors to think about buying industrial or logistics platforms. And our top picks are probably Indonesia and Vietnam. Indonesia, we are seeing you know, manufacturing output growing 5% a year, but it's probably going to accelerate towards 6 to 7%. And in Vietnam, we have a very skilled workforce. The wages are still very low. Political climate is quite stable, and it's attracted a lot of Korean and Japanese uh, technology companies to set up in Vietnam. So you can see from, from this table, it's not very clear, but we get very nice yield on cost, you know, 10 to 12% uh, yield on cost of building an industrial facility, for example, in Philippines, Vietnam, or Indonesia. So it doesn't really make sense to debt fund it, but you know you can equity fund it. And I think what will happen is that you know as these countries and cities urbanize, land will get scarcer because you know there's less farmland left, and then you get some capital appreciation as well. In fact, if you look in the last few years, we've seen 60 to 80 percent increase in capital values for industrial land at the outskirts of cities like Bangkok, KL, and Manila. So I think that trend is, is continuing. And the, the land price, I don't think, is a deterrent for manufacturers because the bulk of their cost is still, still in wages. Well, talking about consumption, I just felt very intrigued that, you know, because we have so many young people in Southeast Asia, we have 300 million Facebook users in Southeast Asia, and that is higher than any other continent in the world. So we have more Facebook users here than in Europe, or in North America, or in India. I think the key is that there's no Facebook in China, <laughs> otherwise we won't be in this position. And when you think about you know, how savvy are the young people in these countries, you look at urbanization rates, well, it's not that high yet. And then you look at internet line subscription, and it's quite low. And then suddenly you look at the people who found something and bought something online, it's actually really high. So a lot of the young people in Southeast Asia, they are technology leapfrogs. They ignore the computers, they don't care about internet line subscriptions, they've bought something on their mobile phones already. And the rate at which they're doing it is about 20-30% of the population have already done it, bought something on their mobile phones, and that's not lower than what you see in the US and in the UK. So these are people who are very, very savvy, and they are even more savvy when they are not inside the city. If they are working outside of the city, the probability is even higher that in the last 60 days, they've bought something on their mobile phones through Facebook. And I think that creates a lot of brand awareness. It creates a lot of desire to consume. And that creates a lot of demand, I think, for retail facilities outside cities in Southeast Asia. You can see that from, from a lot of surveys that these people are buying stuff, but they are not using credit cards. They would rather do cash on delivery and they don't really want delivery to their homes, they want to pick it up. So what we need is investors to cooperate with local developers in Southeast Asia to build community malls all around the cities, uh, outside cities in the suburbs, for these young people to go to a place, have some food and beverage, entertain themselves, and probably buy some stuff. And I think this is the strongest, the need is strongest probably in Indonesia, Vietnam, and Philippines because of the way the population is growing and the number of clusters. I think the problem with Philippines is that there's just too many islands. So we get thousands and thousands of towns and then we have a, a lot of clusters of second, third tier, fourth, fourth tier cities. And that's where I think if you build a community more, you'll be meeting a need and you will do very well out of it. And if we look at uh, retail space uh, provision within cities, it's quite high already in Singapore and KL, but in the rest of the Southeast Asian cities, I think there's still room to grow in terms of more space. And then we take a look at the retail trends in the last, last quarter. I'm sure Sheila talked about what's happening in Manila, but we're seeing strong rental growth in Jakarta. And then Bangkok rents continue to grow and Singapore and KL rents are still falling because you know the supply is quite high and there's a little bit of transition away from you know brick and mortar shopping into online shopping. So in these mature cities, people are losing demand for retail space because people are going online. But outside of cities, actually it's the reverse. And we are still expecting the same trends to continue for the next few years. So we still feel positive 
about uh, you know, retail in um, Bangkok and Jakarta, and then not so bullish for Singapore and KL. Another thing I feel quite strongly about is that we in Southeast Asia really can have an opportunity when we meet the developmental needs in Southeast Asia. The fact is that there's a lot of population, 620 million people, and then when you look at the city folks, a lot of them don't live in modern apartments. There's just not enough housing. So if I look at whether it's Ho Chi Minh City, whether it's Jakarta, Manila, Bangkok, or KL, it's less than 40 apartments for a thousand population. So developers actually can make money by just collaborating with the local developers and build more apartments, especially at the mass market level. The demand is extremely strong. And when you look at you know, even prime apartments, the stock is extremely low. And the affordability is still there. I think a lot of people talk about you know, global, global prices, prices going up in London, in Sydney, you know, in, even in Tokyo. But when I look at, say, the median income household buying the entry-level uh, private housing in Southeast Asia, we're looking at five to seven years of income to buy a house. I think Manila is, is a little bit pricier than the rest, maybe because, you know, of the stage of development. But this is still considered low. It's 18 years of income to buy a house in Hong Kong and about 10 to 11 years to do it in London or Sydney. So seven years is actually relatively healthy. And there's opportunity, I think, in Ho Chi Minh City and in Bangkok for prices to continue to rise with incomes. So this, this just shows you Ho Chi Minh City because prices have come off. So the home price to income ratio has gone down from seven and a half years of income to buy a house to now about four years, which is extremely affordable. And Ho Chi Minh City has just changed their rules to allow foreigners to buy condo units. So I do think that you know, if you have a bit of spare cash, put it in a Ho Chi Minh apartment, it'll probably do well. So it just shows you that prices have come off and it's not like the cycles in the rest of the world. Uh, rest of the world, prices have gone out since 2010, but here, prices have come off and they've risen 10 to 14%. And I still see upside from here for Ho Chi Minh City. And another place where condos are still doing well and probably will still continue to do well is, is Bangkok, where we are seeing you know, sales rate at 75% and all-time high. And uh, we are selling 65,000 units in 2016, which is about 8% higher than 2014. Okay, and I'm just going to go to the office market, which is the last bit, so I don't bore you. <laughs> so a lot of people care about office markets, uh, but I think the biggest thing for me is that throughout the world, office demand has come off after the global financial crisis, mainly because of technology. People can work from home, people don't need typists anymore, they hardly need their secretaries. So when I look at office demand in US and Europe, they've basically halved after the global financial crisis. And in Asia Pacific, the demand for office space is growing 25% slower than before. But in Southeast Asia, demand has accelerated. This means that a lot of the activities, you probably know it really well here because of BPO, right? A lot of the activities is being outsourced from developed markets into cheaper locations where people are intelligent, they are well-educated, and the wages are still very affordable. And we see that continue to grow. We still think that office demand here will grow at 5 to 6% a year because of the economic growth and because technology continues to allow you to outsource even more operations to locations other than your home location. And the office stock is still low. So I have a lot of investors who come to me and go, I feel bullish about Southeast Asia. I want to buy an office building. And I'm like, right, why don't you go build one? Because we need you to build one. You, you, there's no one who's selling it. Just build it because we don't have enough of it. And another thing that you know, people have been dismissing is on office co-working. Well, co-working is a new trend, and a lot of people say that it's a fad and it's an aberration and it would die. But actually, in the more mature markets, people are building custom-made co-working spaces, 400, 500,000 square feet, and they're having big and small tenants going in. You know, you might sit next to Amazon one day, second day you speak to an entrepreneur, third day you're sitting next to a Louis Vuitton employee. And there's a lot of interaction, there's sharing of facilities like legal advice, you can crowdsource health insurance. So I, I think it's probably here to stay. 
And from JLL's perspective, we think that you know, while co-working makes up 1 to 5% of occupied stock today in the more mature markets, this is going to grow to 20 to 30% of occupied office space by 2030 in the developed world. And in Southeast Asia, today is less than 1%, but it's probably going to be 10 to 15% of our occupied stock by 2030. Uh, as you can see, the outsourcing trends are very, very strong in India and Philippines. That's probably going to lead to even more demand for uh, co-working spaces. Well, you know, office is a cyclical thing, except in Manila. Manila, it just goes in a straight line all the way up. But in the rest of the world, offices is highly cyclical. And right now, we like... Uh, uh, Bangkok office, probably, because, you know, if you look at the rents, they've been flat for a year and they've just started to recover. Supply is extremely low in the next five years, so I feel bullish about uh, Bangkok rents. And Singapore, prices have been falling for about three years now, so office rents in Singapore down 25-30%. And we are seeing the pace slowing, so we're expecting Singapore office price, uh, rents to start to recover by the end of this year. And as you know, it's a very cyclical market. So you're you're going to you know, get rents climbing 30% over the next four years. And of course, for Manila, we still expect the trend to continue. Manila probably has been sitting on this side of the clock for a long time, and we don't expect that to change. Uh, so we can see in the last quarter, we've got a stronger than expected take up in Singapore, in KL, and in Bangkok. And we think that uh, Bangkok rents are accelerating and they will continue to grow and uh, rents in Singapore are falling slightly slower. And uh, these, these are the trends. So the, the recovering market is probably Singapore. That's probably going to surprise most people. And I think for Jakarta, I was actually very bullish on Jakarta last year, and then we had some you know, unfortunate incidents. We had political figures going to jail for very little reason. Uh, so that might derail the hypothesis a little bit. But rents are falling and they're accelerating simply because the stock is growing by 25% uh, over the next three years. Extremely high supply, which I think gives us an opportunity to take a look at the market, find some assets to buy, probably in 18 months' time is a good, good entry point for Jakarta. And, well, you know, a lot of people talk about interest rates rising, they care about cap rates, and uh, we look at the yields above bond yields. So this just shows you that uh, across the region, we've got some cap rate compression, uh, but Bangkok still, still seems to stand out because the 10-year bond yields have gone down, but the office yields haven't really compressed as much, so the spread actually hasn't narrowed. So that's mark one market we're quite keen on. Especially also in Bangkok, uh, this year they're having a lot more conversions of property funds into REITs. So when you become a REIT, uh, you can take on more leverage and they will allow the REITs to buy more assets and maybe create more transactions for JLL. And, you know, maybe we'll see some cap rate compression as uh, cap rates haven't compressed enough. So this year we're having the conversion of the largest property fund, which is by Central Patana. They're converting it to a REIT this year. The market cap is going to be in excess of 1.2 billion US dollars. So I think that will, if it trades well, well, it's probably going to attract more listings into the Bangkok market. So I feel quite positive about Bangkok. So I think that's it. Um, key takeaways. Number one is go build it. You know, don't just buy it. Build it. We need a lot more development. We need more offices. We need more apartments. We need more community malls all around. Southeast Asia. Uh, the second thing is domestic consumption is very, very strong. So go buy some industrial, go buy some logistics uh, that will do very well. And, uh, you know, we like office in Singapore, Bangkok, and Manila. So thank you. I just want to show that, you know, JLL, we have a very strong team on the ground. We have 37 research analysts uh, in six different countries. So if you want any data, you know, or investment opportunity, Valuations done, you know, just give me a call. I can point you to the right person in the region. Thank you.